Hello everyone, my name is Richard Hong. I'm currently a mind education specialist specializing in youth and character education. I am also working as a deputy director of International Youth Fellowship in Delhi. I will be lecturing on desire and self-control today. Desire and self-control. It's quite an interesting topic. I once visited Korea. So I got on the subway, which is called the metro here. And I was so shocked. Most of the people who were on the subway, you know, they were talking on their smartphones. So when I looked at them closely, I saw that everyone, they were either looking at their smartphones, talking to someone on their phones, laughing at their phones, starting from young students to old people, all of them were on their phone. So recently I got on the metro here and I observed the people on the metro in India. More than 50% of the people on the metro were on their phones. So as I saw them, how they were spending so much time on their phones without even speaking to one another, I started to think about it. Korea used to be one of the poorest countries in the world. So about 65 years ago, but as one of our presidents declared that we needed to change our minds, he began something called the New Village Movement. I would like to tell you about one very interesting episode. Korea has a very small land space and has no natural resources at all. The only thing we have in an abundance are human resources. So I remember the new village movement, which emphasized that for our country to change, we must first change our mind and that will make us live well. This was a while ago, so everyone, I would like to share about this today. Uh, there was a certain father and a son so who were traveling through a desert. And the reason why they were traveling through the desert was because they had to cross the desert in order for their son to have a good future. But then as they went on their trail, they soon lost the way. So the son, he started to fall into despair. He said, Father, what do we do now? We are not going to be able to see our mother again. The father replied, Son, don't worry. We are heading exactly east. So if we keep going to the east, we will soon reach a village. So he tried to pers persuade his son. But the father's words just was not able to get believed by the son. Father, we're going to die now. The father and the son, they continued to argue. So after some time, they came across a tomb. And the son fell even further into despair. Father, now it's over. So now we are going to die. Look over there. Isn't that a tomb? Those people who are dead there, they must also have lost their way, just like us in this desert. And that's why they're buried over there. Look at them. Look at those tombs. However, the father's heart remained calm. Son, now we are saved. Saved? Father, don't say such things. Look at the tomb. Looking at the same tomb, the son fell into despair. However, the father had hope as he saw the same tomb. Son, we're saved now. The son really could not understand those words. We're saved? We're going to die, father, just like the people in those tombs. Nevertheless, the father's thoughts were completely different. The father began to explain to his son. Son, it's true that they are dead, but who buried them in those tombs? The fact that there is a tomb means that there is a village nearby. So as the son heard these words, he also started to have hope in his heart. Even though they were looking at the same tomb, the son had despair in his heart, but the father planted hope. The president of Korea at that time, he did not look at Korea's despairing circumstances, but having no resources, a small land space, and many people with no money at all, when all of them were in despair, he planted hope in them. We have a population of 30 million. If we educate them and change their minds, 
this country will develop everyone from then korea began to change 65 years later now korea is now an economic powerhouse and a member of the g20 we have so much wealth and much happier levels of life however another problem began to emerge as wealth accumulated the desires inside of people began to grow as well and now there are so many problems that are occurring youths are going astray there is a lack of communication game addiction internet addiction and even smartphone addiction many unspeakable problems have begun to arise leading korea to become a place that just cannot be tamed everyone just because the economy develops does not mean people necessarily become happier as the economy developed our parents generation they began to do everything in their power to make their children happy they did everything their children wanted parents would come back home from work and children from school and they would see money waiting for them on the top of their desks there would be a computer for them or a gaming device for them however they had no place to take rest in their hearts that is why they began to fall into games computers and smartphones now as many youth problems have begun to emerge they said that the most severe generations are the middle school students they have become uncontrollable causing many parents and educational institutes to give up completely on them they are no longer able to guide them without an innovative change in character korea has no future therefore starting from several years ago they began to start the character education and the iyf have been asked to help them as you may all know india too is an it powerhouse just like korea as our gdp grew and our economy developed so did the people's desires according to the lancelot report in 2012 so india's economy is ranked 6th in the world however it has the world's highest suicide rate for ages 15 to 19 whereby 35.5 people per 100000 commit suicide according to the national crime records bureau in 2015 the number of student suicides were 8934 that means that every one hour one student died then what about korea korea has the highest suicide rate among oecd countries for the ages 10 to 19 years the fourth common cause of death in korea itself is suicide so every 40 people commit suicide every day this is the reality of korean education and the government too does not know what to do about the youth problems several years ago when i visited korea i attended an annual program so it's called the world culture camp so many students from abroad attend this camp there were about 5000 students from all over the world who came so we have the world culture camp for 10 days in the mornings there are mind lecture sessions and in the afternoon there is a time to tour also in the afternoon the students are able to exchange with one another through academies So we once went to visit the Hyundai Motor Plant with the students. Everyone do you know about Hyundai Motors? Yeah, it's a very famous company. And when we went there, the employee explained something to us. So he said like this, every 13 seconds a car is produced. So these students really could not believe it. A car consists of a total of 30,000 parts. How can one car be produced every 13 seconds? They really could not believe it. However, as they toured the Hyundai Motors plant, they were shocked to see how the cars were assembled along the conveyor belt. Wow, it's true. Every 13 seconds a car was produced. Everyone, do you know what makes a good car? Of course, it's having a good engine, right? But just because the engine is good does not make it a good car. Let us look at the engine. 
A car has an engine and also a brake. We can express this as desire and self-control. So a car's engine has the ability to make the vehicle move forward and the force which is conveyed to the wheels causes it to speed forward. However, no matter how good the engine may be, if the brakes are not working well, then that car cannot go forward quickly at all. The brakes provide the ability to stop, but they are actually what allow the car to move forward even faster. That is why a good car is when the engine and the brakes act against one another and the braking ability can overcome the power of the engine. So this is what I think of it. The engine is just like the energy that the youth have today. The desire to accomplish their dreams. If it has to be called by some other words, you can call it motivation or willpower. Then the brakes are like self-control. So just as a car with malfunctioning brakes will run into an accident, no matter how good your dreams may be, how good a willpower you might have, or how many accomplishments you may have, if you don't have self-control, then you will fail. The world of the heart is just the same. So that is why I teach many youths about the world of the heart. So especially I lecture about desire and self-control to the youths. And even when I visit prisons, I give this kind of a lecture. So when I was in the United States, I gave the mind lectures to prisoners for about three years. And even in two, South Africa, for two years, I lectured the prisoners. So now the world of the heart is just like a car. So we have desires, but if the self-control to moderate those desires is not present, then it will bring about big problems. Nowadays, educational institutions teach knowledge, but there are not many places that teach about the world of the heart. So that is why many youths are wondering and they don't know what to do. Therefore, I taught about desire and self-control to my own son first. So when my son was 25 months old, so when we first moved to the United States in 1997, so he was my only son after eight years of marriage. And as he grew, I began to think about how I would educate him. So most families with only one child have so many problems. So that is why I was worried about how I would provide mind education to my child and also receive much counseling for him. There was one thing that I learned and that is why I am now a mind education specialist providing mind lectures. So I remember when my son was in the second year of elementary school, one day he came back home from school with a very serious face and he was so angry that he could not withhold his anger. So I asked him, son, what happened? My son explained to me, Father. So at that time, I was living in a city called Dallas and it was close to Mexico. And so there were so many Mexicans and even Pakistani immigrants living over there. But after school, on his way back home, he was bullied by those Mexican and Pakistani children. So they hit him and threw him to the ground. He said that he was so angry that he could not hold in his anger. So he told me, Father, what should I do? I too was extremely angry. My only son had just been beaten up at school, but I began to think so deeply. What should I tell this child? So I took him to a bench and had him sit down. And I began to talk to my son and I told him, Son, I am your father and I can give you food or clothes and a place to sleep but I cannot follow you around all the time. So you need to think about this. I taught my son how to think deeply. I told him you need to learn how to get along with them. And so you must think. Now is not the time for you to express the anger inside of you. But if you think about this, then you will begin to have wisdom. So my son listened quietly and then he replied, Okay, Father, I will think about it. 
And I then told him, Son, after you think about it, you must tell me what conclusion you came to. So after three weeks, one day my son, he came to me and said, Father, I have something to tell you. So I asked him, what is it? He told me, Dad, after I heard what you told me last time, I thought about my friends. And I came to know that I was suffering so much because of anger. But after listening to your words, I began to think about what I should do. So he said, at that time, I started to gain wisdom and I began speaking with those friends. After three weeks, right now, we are close friends. So this was when he was just in the second year of elementary school. And then he joined middle school. So one day, when someone I knew very well came to me, and those were the days when the cell phones were just coming out and everybody started to buy cell phones. So it wasn't a smartphone like now, but the Nokia phones that there were before this, you know, the fold-up phones. So he told me, this is a family phone, it's really nice. There are four in our family, but we received five. So we would like to give one of these phones to your son. So I told that person, thank you, but I'd like to decline this offer. No, this is a free phone. No matter how long you talk, it will not cost you anything at all. But I told him, oh, yes, thank you. But however, I will have to decline your offer. So that person really could not understand. This is a family phone and it's free. But I want to give it to you for your son to use. But why are you refusing? I don't want it. That person just couldn't understand. So he just shook his head. So I told him, between you and me, who do you think loves my son more? Obviously, you love him more. Yes, that is why I don't want this phone. That person still could not understand. So I explained it to my son. Son, today a very good opportunity came. But I refused it. So he told me, why? So he told me, cell phones have now just started to be distributed. But if you obtain the cell phone, then your desires will grow bigger. Then you will not be satisfied when you receive something smaller than it. So that's why I don't want you to have such a good phone when you are so young right now. If you grow your desires before having proper self-control, then you will lose gratitude in your heart. My son just could not understand at that time. Afterwards, several months passed and there was a lady I knew who gave my son a pair of shoes as a gift. They were very nice shoes but when my son received them, he told me like this, Father, these aren't my style. What? They aren't your style? I'm going to change these. I was so angry. So that day I told my son, you don't deserve to wear these shoes. My son replied, Father, this is America. If I don't want it, why shouldn't I be able to have them changed? What? Why are you telling me that I don't deserve to wear them? So I told him, Son, you come and sit here. There is a reason why you don't deserve to wear these shoes. There's exactly one reason. He said, what is it? And I told him, you are taking this gift for granted and as long as you do, you will not have any gratitude in your heart. I don't want to raise my son as a person who knows no gratitude at all. If you have this kind of mind, you will be so unhappy. That is why you can't wear these shoes. My son just could not understand. Father, I will think about it. It was when he was in the first year of middle school. So the next day he knocked on my bedroom door and he told me, Father, I have something to say. So I told him, okay, go on. After you spoke to me, I thought about it. And I said to myself, why is my father saying such things to me? I really wanted to exchange these sh shoes, some other brand that I really liked. But why is my father refusing? Why doesn't he allow me to do it? So then I began to think and then I realized that I had forgotten gratitude as I lived in America. 
oh, I shouldn't wear these shoes. Father, I won't wear these shoes. So I told him, oh, that's good. Thank you so much for listening to me. Then after my son returned from school, something amazing happened. Someone brought the same size, color and style of shoes that my son wanted. I too was so surprised and I showed it to my son. Son, is this what you wanted? Yes, father, what happened? I'm not sure, but after you went to school, your cousin brought these home. So that's how my son, all at once, he had two different pairs of shoes, both brand new. So this was in middle school. And after that, he joined high school. So when he entered into high school, that was a time when we lived in South Africa. I gave mind education lectures in prisons at that time and also to the youth in South Africa. And as you all may know well, there are many robbers in Johannesburg. So in Johannesburg, it's so dangerous to walk out in the streets. So I too was robbed around three times while I lived there for six years and six months. And even recently while visiting, I was robbed on the highway and had my phone stolen. My wife too had money stolen from her on the highway once. When we first lived in South Africa, one day after coming home from the park, he had his cell phone, clothes and even pants stolen from him. He returned home only in his underwear. He was so embarrassed and he told me like this, Father, I don't know what to do. I am so embarrassed. Why did such a thing happen to me? So I then told him, oh, Son, don't avoid this embarrassment. Confront it boldly. This is an experience you cannot purchase with money. Don't be embarrassed about it. Do not avoid this embarrassment. You will definitely gain something valuable from this experience. So after high school, he then prepared to go back to Korea. And at that time, I really did not have much money on me. I only had around $100 at that time. So I called my son and I told him, oh, son, now it's time to practice. He said, practice what? With the money I give you, you will be able to stay at your relatives for some time. But if you have to go to university and you have to solve your basic needs, then there are so many desires that you will have, but you have to reject all of it. The difficulties that you have endured until now, you know, they should have formed some self-control in you without you noticing. And the difficulties you faced should have put down the desires that arose within you. Now go. So we greeted one another, one another and then separated. So after saying bye to him, two years later, one day I got a letter from my son. And he told me like this in his letter, Father, thank you so much, he wrote. And there were four things that he wrote to me. Father, I could not understand you. I did not understand why you were so soft to others, but so strict to me, your only son. But now I think I understand. That was your love. But you did not have a high income, and I was able to receive a national scholarship. And because you did not help me, I was able to foster the strength to deny all the desires that arose within me. So my son was so happy and he told me, Dad, thank you. So after some time, he participated in an English speech contest and he got the judge's award. So his topic was about his father. And then finally he wrote, Father, you were right. I was wrong. I am now attending the most prestigious university in Korea and I'm receiving a full scholarship. So he visited Europe and even recently visited South Africa to also do such mind education activities. Everyone, you must receive training to control your desires from a young age. Just like it's best to learn a language at a young age, the ability to surprise suppress your desires also needs to be learned from a very young age that is why you know, I want to tell you one thing if you do whatever you want to do 
you will become a slave to your desires so there's this one thing that i'd like to really suggest refuse to do some of the things that you want to do and try doing something that you don't want to do then you will notice the ability to self control come from within you so as a result there is something that i also like to ask you to do not even a president of a country can do everything he or she wants if you do not learn about desire and self control then your life will fail so that is why i tell the youth to deliberately refuse doing things they want to do and then to confront and try to do things that they don't want to do they will then learn the amazing wisdom of self control so i would really like to conclude my letter my entire lecture by telling you one last episode so it was when we were hosting the world culture camp in south africa in 2014 So at the time the camp was being held at Soweto Theater which was around 1 hour away from the place we were staying so we needed buses a french company called Atos was supposed to provide buses for us but two days before the camp they said we cannot help you we won't be able to provide assistance so we were so saddened and so disappointed so even the members of our staff were so discouraged So while we were thinking for a long time I saw that the Soweto theater was just right next to a shopping mall called the Jabulani Mall and I asked what does Jabulani mean so then in South African in the local language uh, Jabulani it means be happy Jabulani means be happy right so I told them everyone we have faced a big problem if they don't give us buses then this event cannot take place but i don't want to just accept this disappointment i have decided to change this despair into hope chabulani be happy so i'd like to explain this one word to you chabulani so when they heard this all the staff members they said yes chabulani chabulani Yes this is something to be jabulani about so two days later we were provided with 26 buses and were able to carry out the event successfully 350 youth came and received change in our camp we were able to share their stories of change everyone there are desires arising within us there are desires but we can choose to not accept them So instead of accepting those despair desires and despair you can reject them and plant hope instead I've seen lives change when this is done so I want to tell young students like you about this kind of a world everyone don't do only the things that you want to do try doing the things you don't want to do you will then have self control form inside of you a new strength I firmly believe that it will then lead to a successful life that overcomes many difficulties. Thank you everyone.